so much for your time. Candice here from I2. It gives me great pleasure to intro Danny Myberg, and he has an amazing CV, so let me start. Professor Danny Myberg is the Managing Director of CNRE, the Digital Forensics Lab, and Lextrado EDS, which specializes in digital forensic investigations, data fraud trend analysis, incident response, e-discovery investigations, and litigation support services. Danny established and com commanded the SAPS National Computer Crime Investigation Unit, unit from 2000 to 2002. Danny was the chairman of the Interpol African Working Party on Cybercrime from 2002 until 2005 and represented Africa on the Interpol International Steering Committee on Cybercrime. He is the chairperson of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, a Cyber Forensics Forum from 2011 to early 2016 and again since the beginning of 2018. Danny was also a member of the BRICS Expert Working Group on Cybersecurity aimed at enhancing the coordination on cybersecurity issues between the BRICS states. Danny's qualifications include a BCom Honours in Information Systems, Cyber Forensics at UCT Cum Laude, and MCom Forensic Accounting degree also Cum Laude. Danny is an Associate Professor of Practice at NWU. And over and above all of those amazing titles, he's also a very, very good friend of I2 and my most favorite, favorite human being. So thank you so much for speaking at this session. Uh, we appreciate it, Danny. If you have any questions, please feel free to post in the Q&A section, not the chat section, that's for chatting, Q&A, and we will be sure to get to those either during the session or at the end, we'll be able to ask Danny, but handing over to you and thank you so much. Great. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Can Candice. Uh, it's always such an honor to, to have a chat with you guys and, and having such a great uh, introduction puts the bar really, really high. Um, so thank you very much for everybody attending. I just quickly want to check that I share my, my correct screen. It's given me a couple of weird um, uh, options here. I just want to see. Um, no, it doesn't want to grant access. Okay, you'll have to give me one second. My, my apologies. My invite showed 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock tonight. So I just need to check that it's actually giving us uh, screen sharing here. Just one second. Just want to allow it. Uh, it looks like I'll quickly have to log out and in, if you'll just uh, bear with me. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, as Ryan said, welcome to this last session of our Cyber Awareness Month. Um, hopefully you have enjoyed the session so far. If you log on to our YouTube channel, if you go to i2.co.za and you go all the way to the bottom, you can find our YouTube channel and all of the videos for cyber as well as any other training that has been done. All the recordings are available there for you to refer to, look at, download, etc. So we hope you have enjoyed the Cyber Month session so far. If there is a particular topic that you feel we um, should address, we would be more than happy to do that. So just drop us a message, anyone in the cyber team, and we would be happy to uh, do a webinar on that specific topic. Danny, how are you doing? You're back with us? Uh, I am back. I've enabled it on my side, but unfortunately it says my host has disabled my participant screening sharing. So it looks okay. I'm a normal participant. If you can just... Check that uh, for me. Let me see here. You should be fine now, Danny. No, Danny's got an issue with um, his connection. I think okay. Candace has just dropped off. Okay. Um, Let's see if we can try it, call him back in. Sorry about this, everybody. <clears throat> so as I was saying, if you would like to um, 
download any of the sessions that we have already done, please feel free to go to our YouTube channel. You can find the link on iTunes website. Um, right at the bottom is the YouTube link, and that'll take you straight to our channel so that you can watch all of the, the sessions that we have done, not only on cyber, any of the I2 sessions. Uh, Candice, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, yes. Danny. My apologies when you enabled my screen. I could hear you guys, but it logged me out again. So I'm quickly going to check that I shared. Are we there? Yes, can you see beautiful. My screen? Great stuff. Yes. My apologies for that, you guys. Maybe in the, the question and answer session, I can ask you guys in the meantime, do you know what a bumblebee attack is? Because we're going to talk about a bumblebee uh, today and hopefully that will that's uh, something that's going to be of interest to, to some of your clients as well because we are seeing a couple of weird and wonderful things happening in South Africa. Um, so yes, we are living with cyber crime on a 24/7 basis. Um, we are inundated with with the type of attacks that's going on in South Africa currently. So far we've done approximately, I would say we've done about 30 large, scale uh, cyber breaches, some of which that has hit the, the news so far this year, of which um, ShopRite and Diskim were some of them. Uh, but those level of attacks we are seeing is happening uh, quite a lot. If we have a quick look at what's happening in South Africa, and some of you that has attended some of our previous speeches, we're still dealing with the same old thing, the same type of threats, the reason why is because they're so successful. And the unfortunate part is the criminals are going to keep on doing this until somehow we're blocking them or somehow we are um, able to prevent these type of attacks from, from occurring. So number one, our business email compromises. Sorry, I just want to jump back there. Um, so the business email compromises is where the criminals are hacking into typically an online mail account. They read through the emails and they then see what financial transactions is taking place. Uh, they're climbing between those two parties that is dealing with each other, either a broker or a banker or a private person. Um, and they change the banking details and money gets paid into the wrong account. Now, if I've talked about this quite a lot, um, we are seeing that currently they're estimating that this is the biggest fraud, uh, the most successful fraud globally. If you combine all of the cyber attacks, literally all the ransomware attacks, all the, the data exfiltrations that we've read about globally, it is not a tenth of what the success rate is of business email compromises. What we have to make our clients aware of the fact is that the, the criminals are now shifting their focus in the last six months more or less we've seen them trying to get between employees and employers so what they're now doing is they are emailing a employer emanating uh, or emulating an email address from one of the employees and instructing the finance department to say listen my banking detail has changed please pay my salary uh, into the following bank account. So we might not think it's a big thing, you know, typically they go for the hundreds of thousands or the millions, but now they're doing mass mails uh, on organizations pretending to be employees and changing the banking details of um, employees so that the salaries goes into the wrong accounts, taking small amounts very, very successfully. Also what they do is they are doing it in a stage approach. So what they're doing is they would contact the financial organization or financial department and first tell them, listen, um, I'm, I just want to notify you guys I'm, I'm moving. Um, so just in the mail like that, what type of information would you need for me to update your records? Then you reply back and say, well, we need your new address. So now there's a conversation going. You're expecting this person to change some of the details. They don't just come in with an email and say, let's change the stuff. Um, next, they'll tell you, listen, I'm changing my cell phone number, uh, the area where we're moving to Vodacom's better reception and cell C, for example, or, or M, uh, MTN. Now they make a change on the telephone number. So now if they want, to, if you want to communicate with that client, that you're actually communicating with the criminal. Um, and then they start changing the banking details. So it is a process that they're doing. Um, that it's a story that they're spinning very, very uh, successful really convincing 
And um, the, the main problem is because they're dealing a lot of times with uh, a mail account that is easy to, to falsify, or they're coming from the real mail account, it's difficult for us to, to protect ourselves against it. The other two that we still have is the hacking and ransomware attacks that we are going to talk a little bit more about. The two of them are about 50-50 in terms of the, the number of, of uh, attacks that we're having. They are combining the attacks, so we seldomly saw, see that they're only doing one of the two. They do exfiltrate the information and thereafter encrypting it so that if you don't pay for the decryption, if you're able to restore your system from backups, they still try to extort you for um, not releasing the information. So if we look at how does a threat actor uh, uh, select their targets, we do have drive-by shootings where they just, you know, they mail out a million mails. And if you're one of the unfortunate people that click on link, you fall target to it. Um, we do have retaliation or revenge attacks. Typically, that's more your, your employees, ex-employees, somebody that the organization might have offended, like, say, for example, you're working for a Sassel or a Total, you could offend um, environmental groups, etc., cetera, um, or political parties. Um, we do see a lot of the retaliation attacks also taking place. And then industrial espionage, geopolitical attacks. In the current environment where we are, with the war going on in the Ukraine and right between uh, the Ukraine and Russia, we are seeing an increase in the type of political or geopolitical type of attacks. And luckily, South Africa is still mm, uh, predominantly left out of that environment. But say, for example, now um, this Russian um, uh, billionaire who's instructed his ship to, to sail down to, to, to Cape Town, and the Cape Townians are saying, sorry, we don't want you guys here. That could raise attacks from the Russians, uh, for example, if we don't accept the ship. It's not something that I'm saying, you know, it, it will happen, but I'm just sketching the situation. That's how delicate it is. Or say, for example, we accept the Russian ship here. We could offend uh, international hackers in terms of that we're siding with the Russians and they've they are on the side of the Ukrainians, and now South Africa gets drawn into this type of attack. So really simple, really easy for us to get involved in a lot bigger type of attacks. Something that we've been seeing over the past six months, which I think is really important that we warn people about it um, uh, in, in the industry, is crypto jacking attacks. A crypto jacking attack is where a person will hack into the cloud environment or into the environment of a, a company and install or copy over uh, crypto mining jigs um, with which they can then do crypto mining. We've seen a, quite a large number of them happening in the past six months, specifically within the, the cl uh, cloud environment where the, the perpetrators logs into the uh, organization's environment, what they do, so, so take it, if you rent a, a, a server space um, in AWS, for example, um, pretend that it's a room. You've got a room and inside that room, you've got server standing. So if you want more processing power, you can pay for, for more processors. Um, so you can scale that server up or down. What the criminals do is they don't climb onto your server. They put a, a, a separate, virtual server next to your server. So you don't even see it, but it's inside your cloud room. Okay, now what they do is they start using more services. They're using, they want more RAM, they want more um, uh, CPU power, uh, processing power, etc. We've had clients that within a period of two months, the hackers ran up a bill of more than 500,000 RAM that they used uh, on the client's account um, hacked into the environment, didn't do anything to the client server, but just utilized that, that services. Uh, and it's quite a large bill that the client then gets. So if you're in that environment, you know that typically you don't religiously get your bills at the end of the month because there's typically two or three service providers in the line. So you might only get it 45 days later. By the time that you get it, you get in your uh, account for half a million rand. That could be quite severe. They get in with the administrator account. And now it's a question of who's liable for those additional costs. So we've seen quite a number of those attacks taking place. And typically those are emanating from a targeted attack 
or big game hunting, where they would focus specifically on organization, knowing that that organization's got those type of resources. If we look at the modus operandi, how do they typically uh, attack a company? And this is really important because if you know how a hacker approaches a company, um, if you can prevent those type of things, that's when you make yourself safe. So just think of a situation where you've got a, a housebreaker. All of us has got common sense. So we know typically what a housebreaker uh, does. He, he comes in, he climbs over the fence. He comes late at night. He comes when you are not there. He comes when you're on holiday. So what we can do is we can look at uh, putting out um, uh, security fences, getting a dog, putting up cameras around your house, putting up spotlights around the house, having a security company look at your place. In cyber security, that is exactly the same process that we've got. So the situation that we're facing where we see the most guys coming in, third party breaches, we had it with, with Diskim. Diskim notified uh, the, the marketplace that one of their service providers were breached. It wasn't their data that was actually breached, it came through a third party. So far this year, we've had, I would say about out of the, the, um, the, the, the 30 or so large cases that we did, we've had about five of them that was third party breaches, which is quite a large statistical number in terms of third party breaches. Phishing is still one of the most successful ways where they do mail in phishing emails, where they pretend to be the bank, where they pretend to be something else. Um, and what we're seeing is the phishing attacks are actually, it's my perception that they're increasing and that they're also a lot more um, successful. Main reason for that, I think, is because of the fact that we've had these big breaches like the TransUnion and the Experian, um, where a lot of the South African information um, was leaked out onto the dark web. Now we're living with a situation where we have to admit that the criminals have got our ID numbers, they've got our telephone numbers, a lot of times they've got addresses, they've got banking details, maybe not your PIN and your uh, those type of information. But with that type of information, they can style an email very, very easily. They can contact you and say, listen, we're phoning you from from the bank. We need you to confirm the following to make sure that you're talking to the bank. We're going to give you a couple of, and they give you your bank account number. They give you your telephone number. They give you your address. So it's a lot easier for them to convince you that you're speaking to the, 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 the financial institution or the real uh, person that's supposed to have this detail from you. So it's really easy for them to utilize that information and defraud us. Brute force attacks, where they're guessing passwords or doing password breaking. Um, with the phishing attacks and with all this data of us that's leaked, a lot of information is available and a lot of people are using the same passwords all over the place. So it's easy for the hackers to do those type of attacks on us. Buying of databases, have I been pawned, where you can actually go and log on, see whether your email accounts has been breached, see where you can actually buy databases where your uh, email account was breached. We're seeing that with the remote working, a lot of people are using unprotected mail accounts. It's not a real good idea just to have an online mail account and you don't know what the security settings should be. A lot of times we're seeing that clients are not using all the security settings that they should be uh, utilizing. Known vulnerabilities, patches and stuff. Um, the IT department is not always doing what they're doing because they just overworked and they don't get to everything. Uh, and in about 80% of all the breaches, we are seeing that there was prior alerts um, that went off, but nobody looked at it. So even in some of the big listed companies with large capacities in their IT departments, we see that they don't tend to those alerts. If they did, they would have stopped those attacks early on and, and limiting a lot of the, the damage uh, that, that was done. And then firewalls and passwords, as I've mentioned, passwords, People are using really poor passwords, using the same password everywhere. And then um, we're seeing that people are not uh, optimizing their firewalls and checking their firewalls regularly. So those are the ways that we see out of all the breaches that we see in South Africa, how the criminals are getting in. Now, just to take you through and, and show you um, a practical example of how easy it can be for a criminal to focus on an organization. I'm going to just show you through 
um, an attack that we did on ourselves. So if I had to come and I had to attack our company, Siandre, the digital forensic lab, first thing that you do, go on to Google, check out what's all the information that you see. Go to the website of the organization, have a look, see if you can identify some of the managers, what's the structure, who's who. Some of the law firms loves doing uh, putting up all their personnel, a lot of organizations putting up all their personnel. It is a trove of information for a hacker to actually then jump from that person's uh, mail uh, uh, profile online to his social media profile. So there I saw that it's Danny Marburg and Benny Labuskakni is the directors. I start searching into Danny Marburg, go get a lot of information, um, have a look at this um, a person's history, what is he interested in? And with mine, it pops out immediately. I do a lot of public speaking. So, um, you know, typically a hacker, if they do big game hunting, they are looking for specifically attacking an organization like this, they would spend sometimes up to six weeks just focusing on this organization. So in going into the person's LinkedIn account, looking at the person's Facebook account, building up um, tree structures of who's who in that organization with all the information. So just going through an exercise and just seeing, having a look at my, my Instagram account, uh, all the different accounts, who's my friends, which groups, which organizations am I following? Um, because if I contact a person from one of the organizations that he's following or some of the groups, he would reply and he could reply a lot easier. So just going into all of this information and having a look and see what this person does online. Now, as it occurred at this point in time, I was doing a speech at the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. We were advertising it beforehand. A lot of people, a lot of speakers, a lot of CEOs and, and MDs, et cetera, is responsible for doing this type of marketing. So you do put it out on social media beforehand. And it's really easy to utilize those type of information to uh, formulate an attack against the organization. So yeah, I was doing a speech and I saw that I was doing it for the ACFE, went to the ACFE site, had a look at who's coordinating the, the conference and I got the lady's email account there. Really simple because they want you to actually, um, uh, they, 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 they want you to register at the website or at the conferences, et cetera. So I started doing a lot of work and see when I could see where this account was breached in the past. So I put in Danny Marbert's uh, email account, looked, have I been pawned? Yes, this account has been breached. Unfortunately, all the passwords have been changed so nobody's gonna get in that way. Then started looking a little bit more into the ACFE as well. So I've identified advocate Niman that's coordinating the conference. And what we did was we just went into a really simple uh, application or program online, uh, which is called an anonymizer. And I can then send from this anonymizer, I can actually send emails. So what we did was we, we entered into this application and said, we want to send the following email account and we want to have it look as if it is coming from Manette at the ACFE. Uh, entered the email address from where it must be sent, to whom it must be sent, what is the person's name that we want to be portrayed, as well as what is the body of the email. Now, the email that we wanted to send is simply to say, hi, Danny, thank you for being a speaker at our upcoming conference. Please see attached here with some documentation that we require to supply each speaker with a complimentary gift. And who doesn't want a gift? Uh, or they could say, listen, we want to give you some vouchers uh, to take a lot or something like that. If you could please complete the required information and send it back to me, I could really appreciate it. The password for the zip file is ACFE2020. Um, use the same password to encrypt your data when sending it back. This is to comply with the Poppy Act. So total nonsense that we're talking there. But now I've convinced the person to open up or I've convinced the person to say, this mail is coming from the organization that you are involved in. We're gonna ask you for some information because we wanna give you a reward. And they're also supplying me with a zip file and it's got a, a password on it. So who doesn't want somebody to protect your private information in the current days? So this email, after we've seen it, literally, 
Um, so there's the body that we've got, and we've got an attachment to it, speakerpackage.zip file. So this is how I received this mail. It shows me that it's coming from Manette at the acfe.co.za. This is a real email account. She never sent this mail for me. We did it from, from, a, from a, a website. And this is exactly how I received it. There's nothing in this mail that a normal user would see that this is a falsified mail. There's no way that you can protect. And if you are um, unprotected in this way, you will open this file. The problem now is all of us has got malware scanning and antivirus programs running on our systems. The problem with a zip file is because it's an encrypted file, it's a password protected file, your antivirus can't open that file. Your firewall can't open this file. So typically one of two things happen. Either your setup is, is set up in such a way that it allows it to go through to the user, or on the other side, they might quarantine it, send you a note and say, you've received the mail from the ACFE. Would you like it to receive it? Now, because I'm going to do a speech at the ACFE, I'm going to send, tell them, yes, send it through. So now the criminal was able to deliver that malware inside the organization with any, without being blocked by any of the security measures. So this is the mail that I've received. If we reply to this mail, you'll see that it goes to the real email account. So even if I go and check the email account from where it comes, it goes back to the real email account. But in the background, in the heading information of this mail, you will see we've actually specified a amended return path. So there you'll see we've used Manette at the ACFE hyperlink sa.co.za. Taking you back, do you see over here, we've got Manette at ACFE SA, no hyperlink. Just that small little change, and nobody's going to see it because nobody checks the header information. A lot of times what the hackers also does, they take a company that's got an L or I in the domain name or in the person's name, and they swap it around. They change a capital I to a, a, a lowercase l and vice versa. The human eye doesn't really see it, but if you then reply on that mail, it doesn't go to Manette as the email stipulates, it goes to this falsified account that we've set up. And even if I reply to this, uh, Manette will never know that this communication took place, but myself is then um, uh, uh, breached because of this attack. Um, and this is what is typically referred to as a bumblebee attack. So it's not the nice little Mickey Mouse bumblebee that we see in, in, in cartoons. It's also not our superhero uh, from, um, from the movies. Um, it's the type that you get via an email. So what happens is now that zip file that we've got that they've sent to me with the password, if I unzip that file, uh, so I double click on the file, I unzip it, I have to provide that password. What then happens is the file will open up an ISO image. So in the background that you don't see, what it's actually doing, it's, it's mounting on your normal computer. And I'm, I'm drilling this down, very basic um, uh, explanation of what happens. So it literally opens up a virtual um, image or virtual computer on your computer, virtual drive on your computer that you can't, you as the user can't see. Um, it displays this empty um, document for you, or I can have something in it. Um, I can send you an, an invoice from pick and pay or whatever. It's just something that they show you, but the, the main actions is taking place in the background. It then executes in that virtual drive it executes a hidden tar file. Now, the problem with that is your virus protection is not set up to scan this uh, E drive that never existed on your computer. So that's typically how they are then able to bypass your security measures. Um, and this, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, execution of this file then opens up an external connection with a command and control server on the outside. So literally what happens now is 
Um, they open up a virtual computer on your computer that is instructed to link out to an external um, server. Everything runs in RAM. So after they uh, switch off that virtual server or that virtual drive, everything gets lost. So we battle a lot to, to recover that information, to conduct the investigation after they've done this. And literally what they can then do is to copy over, um, typically inside this virtual drive that they're opening up, they've already installed all the malware that they need to execute um, to collect passwords off your environment. So all of this runs in RAM and is bypassing your security measures. And the next moment you see this ugly face popping up and saying, listen, all your files have been encrypted. Um, this is the ransom attack. So literally with this type of attack, they nullify a lot of the security measures of organizations um, because of the complexity and the advancement of this type of attacks. I know my time is running out a little bit. I'm going to ask that we just have a little bit more time because of the shortfall I've had in the beginning. But here we've got the, the, um, the, pub, the note that was published by the hacker group that was responsible for the, the, the recent hack on TransUnion. We basically, the, the hacking group's name was Naughty for Sec. Um, they invited employees in South Africa to say, if you're working in a sensitive environment like medical, electricity, water, hospitals, um, we want to pay you to facilitate access to in our environment. So literally organizations now, our threat is not out there anymore. It could be our employees that is helping them. So we are seeing that they are um, actively in recruiting people. We've had situations already after this attack where we do suspect there was internal employees involved in. Uh, we are busy with a prosecution currently of a situation of that. And from there, they can do anything. They can literally um, bring in their tools, um, exfiltrate data, um, run into a situation where they've encrypted the data, uh, asking for ransom, et cetera. So our message for, for people out there is not if, but when uh, a cyber uh, attack happens on an organization, you have to be prepared. So this is basically the only thing that we can do to, to, to protect organizations. You must maintain all the security, they must have the firewalls, et cetera. All of those basics needs to be there. But what we see, uh, organizations are better prepared. Um, they prepare for these in, in, in the sense that um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not something that they think will never happen with them. The better prepared an organization is, the quicker we resolve it, the less damage there is, and the quicker the organization is able to, to move forward. So organizations should have IR policies, incident response policies and plans. They should develop standing operating procedures that if they are breached, how do they handle it? What do they do? If it's a data exfiltration, how do you handle that? If it's a data encryption, how do you handle that? They must have their communication channel set up. We've dealt with a client now recently where um, when the emails were encrypted, they've got, they've got no way of communicating with their personnel. It's a, a global organization, and they had to quickly start building up WhatsApp groups, which took quite a lot of time. They, were, they had more than 10,000 employees, so to get all those contact details from all the regions took a lot of time. They have to identify who the incident response team is, who's responsible for what, uh, define the services, all those major things that you need to do prior to a breach, because you don't want to take decisions in, in a crisis situation. You don't want to deal with this in a crisis situation. So a, num a number of things that you can also advise clients is um, how, can they, how can they focus on these type of, or um, the security stuff. Um, the human person or the human firewall is basically one of our most uh, helpful allies in this whole thing. So they must have security awareness campaigns for their personnel. If your personnel is, is trained um, and aware of how phishing attacks happen, um, not posting uh, too much information about themselves on social media, um, be aware of what the risks are in terms of hackers having all our information out there, then they can help an organization to be better protected. So um, your security awareness sh should be top priority. 
With that also, what we're doing is fishing campaigns, simulations for them, so that these organizations are prepared and ready for this type of attacks. Update antivirus. We are seeing that typically an antivirus is outdated with more than 60 days before it's update, updated. And in that 60 days, there's so much damage that a hacker a group can do. Um, utilizing secure VPN connections, not allowing their personnel just to, to connect uh, without two-factor authentication. The majority of the attacks are coming in, even if they've gotten into a phishing attack or through um, uh, uh, a, a brute force attack, they do create uh, secondary um, channels to log into the organization. Those typically come through VPN connections. And if your VPN and security is not up to scratch, they can actually utilize that to, for a period as long as 200 days, log in and out of the organization. Um, cyber insurance, obviously that's why we're here. So for me, um, organization-wise for ourselves, um, we deal with all the prevention and detection mechanisms. So my prevention is having an antivirus, having a firewall. Detection is having a security operations center, SOC center, looking at the alerts, having people looking at what's happening on my environment. Um, so all of those I do, but I do not skip on the aspect that if something goes wrong, how will I respond? And, and cyber insurance for me is one of the most critical aspects to say, if you're in that vehicle coll uh, collision, <laughs> do you have somebody that's going to help you repair your vehicle? And that's why cyber insurance for me personally really, really uh, is, is critical. Then with the remote working, we've seen that a lot of people are uh, just using their routers at home. Um, they take it out of the box. Somebody comes and installs it for them. And the password is still password. It's a default password. So if I scan your house, um, I'll see what type of router you, you have because it's it's I can actually ping it from the outside. And I just go and Google and say, um, this is a this is a IBM router. Um, what's the default password for, for this router? And I try it, and 80% of the time it's it's still the default password. Update software and patch management. We're seeing that patch management is outdated 170 days. So patch management is if if, say, for example, organization runs a Salesforce firewall, um, if somebody breaches or somebody does a print test, we notify the supplier. We say, listen, there's a vulnerability on the system. Um, if, I, if I send an ABC to the firewall, it allows me to log on to it. Then the supplier goes, they fix it, and they make it available to all their clients globally. So those are the patches that they roll out. We're seeing that those critical patches, the critical patch is something that a hacker can utilize to compromise, fully compromise the organization's security. Some of them are outdated 180 days on average. So that's unfortunate reality that we're living with. Um, and then segregation of work and, 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 and home. A lot of people are working uh, remotely um, and they're sharing the same devices that the kids are using um, to do their work. Which, which, you know, nobody's got the, the money necessary to, to buy every child their own laptop. So the, the, or the, the, the family can be working on one or two devices, but the kids are going to, to torrent sites, they're downloading, downloading movies, they, they're on gaming sites, and those sites are a trove a lot of times for hackers in terms of um, compromising local devices, et cetera. And in the meantime, when you come for your eight to, to five shift in the, during daytime, um, you're logging in from that um, uh, breached computer onto an environment. We've now helped, helped a quite a large cl client with one of the employees was downloading um, uh, virtual drives. He was studying into security. So to test a lot of these things, you can't have a network in your, in your house environment that you can emulate. So he was downloading virtual machines and embedded in one of these virtual machines was malware that he actually compromised his employer's environment with while he was playing around and studying for, for his IT security degree, um, causing huge, huge damage to the organization. Um, and then, as I said, remote desktops, chat rooms, um, unsafe environments, um, we, we shouldn't be going to that. So those are some of the, the things that we can advise our clients, how they can secure themselves. I hope you found this helpful. 
Uh, Candice, I think my time is up. Is there any questions that we've got? Thank you so much, Danny. That was really interesting. Um, we do, I think we're going till 11. So if you'd like to continue, please do. Um, yes, there is a question um, from Lisa, but if you want to carry on, Danny, then I'll just type that. It's more an insurance around how do you quantify the, the limit purchased. So I was just sure. typing a response to Lisa now, but please carry right. on and go ahead. So I think it's really important. Thank you very much, Candice. Um, just to reiterate, uh, we've, we've talked about this within the cyber insurance environment quite a lot, is what is some of the services that a client needs within that uh, crisis period? So um, we have big banks, the APSAs and the Standard Bank, they've got just enough employees. Nobody runs and they've got 100 extra employees that's just sitting there for a crisis to happen. Um, you know, and if a bank can't afford 100 security experts to just sit around protecting them, um, how does a small company do that? So uh, cyber insurance and, and the type of services that we do for a client in that critical system is bringing that additional capacity for them in the time of need, in that period where they, they've been breached. And I can tell you now, uh, a cyber breach um, totally dis dis disables an organization. If all your systems are encrypted, management is just flabbergasted. They are dealing with panic. So, um, you know, we, we, we did a simulation once where the CEO nearly had a heart attack and it was just a simulation. Uh, he didn't know it was a simulation, but literally they told us to stop and they they assessed him to see whether whether he um, he uh, he was still all right. Um, so and it's that that severe situation. So you don't want to to fall around because the longer you don't know how to deal with that situation, the the, the bigger the damage is, the, the the bigger the consequences are. So um, it's really important that in that crisis situation that you get experts that uh, that knows what happens that knows how to deal with it to, to come and help you and that's where this the the incident response through the cyber insurance comes comes to play quite a lot we do this for a living um so we do get t telephone calls nearly every weekend uh we typically work about five weekends out of the four e every month um and we see this on a daily basis where a client's own IT service provider or his own IT personnel, they might see a hack take place once or twice in their life. Um, for them, you know, it's, it's still, it's, it's still um, uh, exciting, if I can call it that. For us, we see how they, what is deployed on the environment, um, how do they gain access. And from that, from our experience, we've got a really good idea who we're dealing with what type of methodology they follow. So we can remediate that situation a lot faster. So we assist clients with the containment of it, the eradication, getting the hackers and the malware out, doing deep dive forensics, um, analyzing because the hackers are average on a system in South Africa more than 200 days. So we need to go and have a look, what were they doing on the system? Did they plant stuff? Did they change anything on the environment? Um, there's a lot of um, emphasis and need for that forensic investigation also to report to stakeholders, to report to data subjects, to report to the information regulator or to the authorities in terms of what the hackers did, what they accessed, what they copied out, those type of things. Uh, remediation, assisting that client in rebuilding the environment. Um, we had a, a law firm that told us they will never negotiate with hackers. So they were they were hacked, they were ransomed. The IT department said to them, no problem, we'll just restore the backups. So management told us, happy, we're not gonna negotiate at all. Um, we're not supporting terrorists, with which I totally agree. About 40 minutes later, the IT department came back and said, we've got a little bit of a problem. It seems our backups are also encrypted. So the management team said, how, how, how much backups did we lose? We lost about six months worth of, of, of backups. Immediately that firm knew, listen, they didn't even know what work they were busy with. They didn't know what clients to bill, which clients have already uh, received their bills, et cetera. That's the quickest I've ever seen a team uh, turning to me and say, Danny, let's quickly just assess again that, that negotiation process. So, um, you know, that interruption, that firm was losing, they estimated, something like 10 million rand per day. 
And if you have to rebuild the system and it's going to take you 45 days, we're talking about 45 million rand of business interruption potentially. So we want to get that period down as quickly as possible. We want to help them get back, get up and running again to limit uh, damage as, as far as possible. And then sometimes we need to look at the, the ransom process. It's not something um, you know that, that is nice to do, but sometimes it does become a requirement. So we've seen that uh, I've myself, I've been involved in about, I'm um, up to about 16 to 18 negotiations over the past two and a half years, uh, of which we did about 13 uh, ransom payments, different situations, either um, decrypting the information, so getting the decryption keys from the hackers, or where our clients wanted more time uh, to notify all the data subjects, they were prepared to pay the ransom amount so that we could postpone um, the, the release of the information. Um, so there's quite a lot of statistics available that actually indicates that more than 40% of the ransom victims in South Africa is actually paying the ransom demands. There's quite a big push internationally, um, specifically from America, to make the paying of ransom totally illegal, because what we are doing, we are supporting crime. But the problem is, if you're sitting with an organization, just take it for, for yourself. If your total organization is ransomed, all your data is lost, all your backups is lost, and management decides to say, um, it's going to be cheaper for us just to, to um, you know, pay off all their employees, close our business down, um, it's, it's your livelihood. Uh, we've had two of our clients that actually committed suicide after being the victims of ransomware. Like they just you know, we, we weren't involved in, in the, the, the suicides, but we heard afterwards that they committed suicide. And during those discussions, they said to us, there's no way they can afford this ransom. There's no way they can uh, resolve their business. They've lost too much. Um, and that was the end, two deaths uh, emanating from it. So um, it is a real severe situation. And a lot of times organizations do consider that, that ransom process. We do advise them not to do it, but then there are the situations where it is um, a lot of times uh, it is something that you need to consider in a very, very controlled environment. So um, taking all of those in, in, into consideration, uh, one thing needs to say, what is that process that we need to follow? So um, we need to consider the situation. What's the objective? Uh, is it to get the decryption keys? Is it to buy time? Is it to get an undertaking from the hackers not to publish the data? Um, so, so far in all the situations that we've been involved in, we, in 100% of them, we were able to get the decryption keys. In 100% of them also, the hackers never or so far did not publish the data. Um, I don't know why, I can't, I, I can tell you now, you can never guarantee you're dealing with a criminal. So after you've paid him 2 million rand, the easiest thing for him to do is to say, oh, um, uh, pay me 2 million more or I don't give you the key. So um, it's uh, my only uh, you know, uh, uh, conclusion is that because of the fact that it if it becomes known that the group does not give you the decryption keys or does publish the information after you've paid them, if it becomes known, you know, people will stop making that payment. So it's a, a delicate situation between the negotiator and the hacker in terms of playing this game. Um, and so far, the oldest case that we've been involved in is about five, six years now, where a medical group in South Africa was hit, and the hackers till today has not published that information. So the, we're holding thumbs that it stays that way. We do the dark web monitoring for the clients to see if it's it's published somewhere that we can do takedowns on them, get that data removed as quickly as possible. But yeah, okay. Um, so number one, we do get a, a legal opinion. Is it legal? Can we make that payment? So far, all the legal opinions that we've received in South Africa indicates that it is legal. It's legal under the situation where we're not supporting a terrorist group directly. So I'll, I'll get to that just now. So we have a look, we do intelligence investigation into that group. We analyze the malware, look which groups typically use this malware. Is there changes made to that code, which we can um, link to a specific group? We do research on the dark web on that malware, as well as the, the group that uses it. 
We try to identify previous victims. We make contact with that victims. We ask them, how did they gain access? What did they do? Um, what amounts did you settle on? Did they give you the decryption keys when you paid, et cetera? We analyze the ransom notes, C2. All the reason why we're doing this, we want as much information as possible before we go into these negotiations. So we look at the dark web, what's known about these guys. We look at the crypto wallet that they supplied us with. Was it connected with previous crimes? Was it used previously? Uh, the, the point of compromise, the methodology that they used, the scripts that they used. And we utilize all of this to try and identify who the criminals are. The reason why we do that is one, we want the information so that we can deal with this current act as sufficient or as, as efficiently as possible. But then also we need to go through the OFAC uh, clearance process. The OFAC is an international uh, process that you need to follow to make sure that you are not paying uh, Al-Qaeda or a, 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 a named entity, a sanctioned entity that you're not allowed to support. So we go through the process of doing the OFAC clearance processes before we come back and say, this entity is not a, a sanctioned entity, we are able to, to make that payment to them. Go through the not notification or the negotiation processes, which, as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a thing that I never prepared for. Luckily, from my background being in the police force, I, I received some training that I apply very effectively in this environment. And as I said, I've, I've done 18, uh, 16 to 18 negotiations so far, really successfully, um, if, if I say so myself. Um, we assist the client with that negotiations, obviously keeping them updated, trying to meet the objective of it. Are we trying to get the data back, the decryption key or by time? Um, do that negotiations and then also assist with if there is a payment to be made. You know, all organizations are not geared or rigged to have crypto wallets and to do that payment in the correct fashion. Um, there's a lot of developments within the crypto environment, sorry, from the Reserve Bank, from SARS in the last couple, in the last six months, more or less. So you have to be careful in terms of how do you make the payment. You can't just uh, make a payment, um, uh, 10 million Rand, and it goes overseas without notifying SARS. So there's a lot of processes to follow. And then also afterwards and during that process, what's the reporting obligation on that organization? Do they need to report it, uh, report it to international and local law enforcement? When do you need to report it? Where do you report it? How do you report it to the FIC, Reserve Bank, Treasury, FIC, uh, um, FSCA, uh, if you're a listed company, for example, the information regulator, if you are governed by a regulatory body in your field, um, how do you handle those type of things? What do you tell them? What do you need to tell them? Um, so there's a lot of PR and legal advice that needs to go into this process as, as well. And then obviously the data subject access request that we're also seeing, it's becoming um, one of the main aspects here in South Africa as well. In terms of the Poppy Act, a data subject is allowed to ask what information of mine has leaked, um, who had access to it, uh, all those type of information, and to deal with 5,000 or 10,000 data subjects that all of a sudden is phoning an organization to say, what have you done with my data it becomes really, really uh, difficult to handle. So we assist the client to, to manage that, that process. And that is my song and dance for today. Yay, thank you so much, Danny. There is a question um, that I'd like to pass over to you. It's from Julene. And the question is, how do you know if an email is not actually a genuine email? Especially okay. if you expect an email from someone and all of it looks legit. Um, how do you know when you can inform IT that it is good to release? Okay, I just quickly want to see um, I've lost my screen. Um, and it's, it looks like I can't stop the, 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 the uh, sharing from my side. Okay, so as I've showed you guys, number one, if you're dealing with, with just normal phishing mails, the best thing to do is to number one, if they send you, if anybody sends you a link embedded in an email, that is suspect for me. So um, what you need to do is if you've got a, a link saying taking you to APSA Bank, go and hover on it, take your cursor, your mouse, hover with your cursor on that link. 
it'll create a small little pop-up that opens up that shows you where that link actually goes to. So if that link doesn't say app site, it says, um, uh, you know, something weird about uh, fragrances and, and, and nonsense, then you know, listen, this is this is a, most probably a phishing link. Um, then secondly, if you are receiving an email from a person with a zip file, uh, and that zip, zip, zip file is password protected, or any file that's password protected, really be cautious in terms of opening that file. Rather send it to your, your IT department and tell them I've received this file. It is a bit suspicious for me. Can you scan it for me prior to, to me uh, utilizing, even if you're sitting in, big, in a big organization. Then if you receive any instruction, financial instruction from clients, any instruction to change details in terms of address, banking details, cell phone details, because remember, they don't jump in with banking details first. So they first start changing different uh, uh, details. Um, verify that email account. So number one, if somebody tells you to change the banking details, don't phone the number that is in the, the email signature because that email signature is just going to take you to the criminals. Verify with the record that you've got um, on, 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 on all the detail that you've got on record. So when that client opened their account, go to the file, get it from there, or look at the email that you received from them a year ago. Look at the, uh, the telephone number or the email address from there and uh, check back on it. Then make sure that when you're communicating with a person with an email account, um, just make sure about that email account. See if there was alteration, modification made to it. Um, so those are the best that you can do. Um, and then lastly, if you go into the header information of that mail, there's where you can actually see um, the, the real detail where it goes through. So the rest can all be edited, but I know not everybody is uh, uh, computer experts in terms of reading uh, email header information, but if you've got a suspicion of it, rather be cautious, send it to an IT guy, have them look at it before you reply back to it. Thank you so much, Danny, for that valuable advice. Appreciate it. Um, and also to the four, more than 400 brokers who joined the session today, um, we hope you have found it as informative as it always is from Danny. I did post our YouTube channel into the chat section where this recording will be uploaded um, once we are able to, to put that on. But thank you so much, Danny. We really appreciate your, your valuable advice as always. And we love it when you present for us. Thank you so much. Great. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. My apologies again for the, the, the delay in the beginning, but great stuff. I appreciate it. Thanks. Hey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, everybody. And have a beautiful day further. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Danny. And maybe we should mention that Danny will be joining us on our Claims Road shows. So if any of you would like to pick his brain in person, Danny will stuff. definitely be touring with us, Joburg, um, Durban and Cape Town. And if you haven't received your invite, please feel free to drop me a line or Candice and we'll send you through that invite. Cool. Thanks, everyone.